Alrighty, um, we're continuing with our study of the book of Romans and we are still dealing with objection with the first objection that began in at the beginning of chapter 6 we're down to the last section of the first objection so we'll cover that in the first few minutes and then get into the get into the second objection you'll find that the second objection is kind of a variation on the theme of the first and in fact, the third is a variation on the theme of the second. So they're, um, they're all kind of the same. So some of the arguments against the objections are kind of the same. But what Paul does is he takes this and he, he, he'll start a point early and then he fleshes it out later on. So you're going to see many times throughout the book of Romans where you'll see something that he commented on earlier in the, in, the, in the book and then goes into detail later in the book to explain what he commented on early in the book. And it kind of does this seesaw thing all the way through that book where he'll, he'll drop an idea over in chapter 1, he'll flesh it out a little bit in chapter 3, He'll get into great detail into it in chapter 7. And so, so you tend to hear the same type of a thing. It's just more detail as it goes along. Okay. Um, now remembering back, the objection one is the objection that grace permits men to live in sin. Grace permits live, men to live in, in sin. And I, I, I've told the story, the Philpot story a couple of times about the guy in the uh, about the other minister that in the train that um, the other minister tried to make this argument that I don't believe that doctrine because it leads men to lasciviousness and sin and and Philpott said well has it left has it led you there he said well certainly not I don't believe it he said well has it led me there he goes well no I suppose not he says well then if it doesn't lead those that don't believe it to sin and it doesn't leave lead those that do believe it to sin, then who exactly does it lead to sin? But that's the same argument. That's the other side. If you can, the argument can come at you that it, it then allows people to live in sin so I can live however I want, or on the religious side, you can't have that doctrine because that leads people to sin and, okay, two, two sides of the same coin, if you will. That's what we're dealing with here. This runs from chapter 6, verse 1, all the way through verse 14. We are now down to verses 12 through 14, the last section. And Paul is making the point that because we have a vital union with Christ, because we're dead to sin and no longer need to live in sin, and because we're to reckon ourselves to be part of that group that Christ saved, then therefore we are to yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness unto God because of the change in our heart we are to exercise it and use it in God's service. Okay, that's the intro to this last section. So let's look at this, it's verses 12 through 14 where Paul says, and he's just, he just finished making the point that we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin. In other words, count yourselves, consider yourselves dead to sin. Because if you are born again, you are. Christ has paid, so to the Christian, you don't have to live in sin. You have the ability to not live in sin. Now, most of us don't practice it perfectly. And as we continue on, and when we get into chapter 7, especially towards the end of chapter 7, you'll see why we don't, do, we don't practice it perfectly and why Paul keeps saying over and over and over and over again to attempt to practice it perfectly anyway, okay? But the point that we just finished last week was you're a child of God, start acting like one. You don't have to live in sin, so quit living in sin and start acting like you are what you actually are. And it, then in, in this section, in beginning at verse 12, we read, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, 
But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now we got a few points we need to make in, in this just so that we understand. First off, this section where it says um, ye are not under the law but under grace. I went too far. Okay. We'll get back to that. First off, the fact that Paul says let not sin reign shows us that we have an ability in this area. Paul would not tell us to not do something that we don't have the ability to do. We have the ability to not let sin reign in our mortal body. We have that ability in the new birth. The word reign means, um, to, in, in verse 12 here, it means to possess or exercise sovereign power or authority, to rule to be predominant, to prevail, to rule, to have superior or uncontrolled dominion. We are not to allow sin to have uncontrolled dominion, to exercise sovereign power or authority over us, to rule over us. Now understand, an unregenerate person has no option and no ability to do anything other than letting sin reign over them and have so sovereign power. They, they don't have the ability to not do it. That's what they do. But you, as children of God, have the ability to not allow sin to reign over your life. Okay? In verse 14, it mentions dominion. It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Dominion is sovereign or supreme authority, the power of governing and controlling. Sin does not have dominion over the child of God. It does have dominion over the unregenerate. That's the only nature they have. And so they do what comes naturally to them. They have nothing to stop it. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't do good. They do. But, but the reason that they do good is different for the reason that the child of God does good. They do good because it's going to bring them something. There's something in it for them. There's a lot of people that go to church, and the reason they go to church is because it makes them look better and helps them in their business dealings. It's a, it, it has nothing to do with God. They don't go to church because they want to glorify God. They go to church because they want to glorify themselves. And that's what unregenerate people do. So understand, it's not that all unregenerate people do evil all the time. Now, I might say that going to church for, for that type of an idea is actually a form of evil because you're not going there to worship God, but, but you, get the, you get the point. It's not like they're all devils running around doing devilish stuff, but their, their mind is not set on trying to glorify God as much as it is trying to help themselves with something. Okay. Um, now, finally, this word yield in verse 13, where it says, um, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Um, this word yield means to permit, to grant, to allow, to decide to give in and give up. Kind of like when somebody's got you down on the ground with your hand behind your, and eventually you, you yell uncle. Well, that's the point where you yield. You just, finally, you give up. And so Paul's saying, don't give up and follow the devil. Don't give up the warfare. There's that passage over in one of the Timothys where it, close to the end of his life, he said, I have fought a good fight. Um, what is it? I have finished my course, I've kept the faith. He kept fighting up until the time that Nero took his head off. He didn't yield to the flesh. So he did exactly what he's teaching here. Don't yield, don't give up. Just hang in there. Don't, 
don't yield yourself to sin and and there, you're going to see some diabolical things involved in in yielding to this stuff um, we're told over in James chapter 1 James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 but look at verse 13 to get the context let no man say when he is tempted I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil evil neither tempteth he any man but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed then when lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death where we get into problems first you start thinking about it before you commit the act you think about it okay and then if you think about it long enough the longer you think about it the better chance there is that you're just gonna go ahead and commit yourself to doing it and then once you've done it then it's sin right well it actually gets deeper than that as we're going to see a little bit later on in this study um, but this is the I see that's the idea of yielding it starts to come into your mind and then if you yield to it it becomes sin there's not much you can do to keep it from coming into your mind you live within a flesh nature that wants desperately to sin so it's it's in you and it's not like it's an outside force it's part of you the point is don't give in to it we're, we're told over in in second timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 Okay, that's the wrong verse. Oh, verse 22, 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee also youthful lusts. I'm going to stop right, that's all I need. Flee also, now that does not mean the lust of teenagers. That means flee them when they're still young, before they've had a chance to take root. As soon as it starts to come into your head, get away from it right then flee it then because if you let it grow up then you're going to do it then you're going to have to go back to God and apologize for doing something that you know better you shouldn't have done to start with okay and so rather than yield to it flee it um, now notice this is this is interesting Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Okay? Whether you yield and follow the unregenerate flesh, or whether you follow God with the regenerate new man, in either case, you're yielding. You're yielding in either case. Either your sinful flesh nature does what it wants to do, which is sin, and the new man yields to the flesh and says, okay, I give up, I'm going to do the sin. Or the new man wars with the old man and the old sinful unregenerate flesh has to yield to the new man. One or the other. There's a yielding going on in here. Paul is instructing us not to give in to what the flesh wants but do give in to what the spirit wants don't yield to the sin do yield to the new man okay so when the war when when this warfare starts when the thought comes into your you know it's wrong so follow the side that's telling you it's wrong and don't do it now, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds really simple. I know that it really isn't. Um, and like I say, as we get down into the end of chapter 7, you're going to see why it really isn't. But Paul t is telling us to don't yield to the sin. 
yield to the right. Now, a regenerate child of God does not have to allow sin to rule over him anymore. You have the ability in the new birth not to allow sin to rule over you anymore. Um, so here's the situation. In the new birth, God changes our spirit and our soul. He gives us a new heart, but our, rem our body remains like it always has. Our experiences, our habits, our mental faculties, our mental desires, all that stuff that's in the flesh just stays there. It doesn't go away. The new man is changed. The old man, the flesh, is just as rotten as it ever was, and it's going to continue that way until the day you finally fall over and die. And there's where the warfare comes in. If you let go of the reins and let the flesh run, you're going to run out and be the just as... And you know what? I remember Conrad talking about this, and, and I've lived in the ministry long enough now to, to, to say that I can agree with him. When, even when, when children of God get in the flesh, it's uglier than dealing with folks out there that have no spiritual nature to them at all. And I think it's because of all the pent up years of not being sinful that when they finally let go, it can get ugly. It can tear a church apart. We've seen it over and over and over again where people that were, we thought were chilled, and I'm not referring to anybody in here, but out west, some of the things that happened out west, when those people got in the flesh, it was horrible. It was just horrible. And it, which proves that you still got that nature in you. And if you let it go there, it's going to go there. That's, that's just where it wants to go. So, the inward man's warring with this old unregenerate nature, and our old re unregenerate nature wants to do what it's always done, and Paul's saying, even though your sinful flesh remains, don't listen to it, but follow the Spirit. Okay? Now, this, sa this next section here, in, uh, where it says that you are not under law, but under grace. In the broadest sense of the law here, this is the law of Moses, and grace is the gospel. You're not under the law, you're not under the law of Moses, you're under the gospel. The deeper meaning is that the law is in the sense of doing your own works of righteousness to get righteous and gain favor with God. Remember, I covered this last week. The natural mind believes that there is something I have to do in order to gain favor with God and, and, and get rid of the sin. That is planted within the natural mind. You're not under that. If you're a child of God, you're not under that. You're under the gospel in which Christ is the one that paid that price, and that's how you gain favor with God. Um, I have a note here. Let me... Yeah, to turn to Romans chapter 10, where Paul is talking about, he's talking about these, about Jews. Now, when we get there, we'll get into great detail on it. I don't want to do that now, but he's talking about Jews that are striving, striving to be righteous under the law. They think, like everyone else, that it's this law that they have to keep in order to gain favor with God and become righteous and become children of God and be saved. Okay? And Paul says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Is that not what you see in so many folks? They're so busy trying to establish their own righteousness that they refuse to listen to the fact that they've already been saved, so quit working about trying to get saved and start working about coming into fellowship. Oh, no, 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 I gotta get saved first. And that's what you find in most religions. 
I remember, now, the church that I grew up in was not as bad as some. Um, some of the verses, churches that I visited um, before I was converted were really bad on this point. But it seems like they, they concentrate. Con the Sunday morning service is nothing more than an infomercial about how to get saved. And the altar call is all about getting you down there to get you saved. And yet, that's not what we're here for. We're supposed to feed people. Well, you think about this. When, when you're a newborn child of God, you really haven't eaten yet, right? Well, if all I'm doing is concentrating on trying to turn everybody into newborn children of God, how am I going to feed them? And as a result, those, the people starve to death in, in, in that type of an environment. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to be concentrating so much on trying to establish our own righteousness. We're supposed to give up and yield to the righteousness of God, which says that if you're a believer, you're already born again. So quit worrying about that aspect of it. Now, Elder Gerald used to, used to use this analogy. Okay, we're not under the law of Moses. We're under the gospel. Make sense? Okay, there are laws in the United States of America for which I can be executed. If I murder someone in the United States of America, I can be executed for that, right? There are laws in Germany for which I can be executed. If I murder someone there, I can be executed under the laws of Germany, all right? Now, if I go on a rampage and I murder someone, here in America, I don't have to worry about the laws of Germany, do I? I'm not in Germany. I'm not under those laws. I'm under the laws of the United States of America. All right? As a Christian, I'm not under the law of Moses. I'm under the gospel. Do you see the difference? So while I don't have to worry about Germany's laws while I live here, as a Christian, I don't have to worry about the law of Moses either, because I don't live under those laws. I live under the gospel. I live under the rules that are laid out in the gospel, and it's a completely different thing. Because in the gospel, where, while, while the law had been perverted so that you believed that that was what got you eternally saved, the gospel message is, that's not what it was about to start with. The gospel message is, you if you're a believer, you are eternally saved. Now come into fellowship. Okay, so we're not, under, we're not under that law. We don't live in Germany. We're under grace. We live under the gospel. Does that make sense? I'm still seeing some cloudy eyes, but... Um, In Romans 8 and verse 2, it refers to the, the law that you're actually under. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin, that was what the law of Moses was. The law of Moses never brought life to anybody. The law of Moses pointed out that you were a sinner and said that you were guilty and that you couldn't live by it. So there you have the law of sin and death. You're not under that if you're under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If you're a child of God, you're under his law. You're not under the law of Moses. So there's no need to concentrate so much on the law of Moses. Now, remember what our objection was. We're still dealing with an answer to an objection which said that grace permits men to sin. So we don't need to keep the, there's no need to keep the law. Well, folks, there ain't no need to keep the law anyway relative to being saved. There never was. Okay. Um, look at Hebrews chapter 12. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7 and verse, and verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, this is talking about Melchizedek and, and the fact that, that 
Christ was not under the Levitical priesthood. He was, he was under the priesthood of Melchizedek. Um, and, and so Paul says, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. You remember, Moses' law had the Aaronic priesthood in it. We're not under that. We're not even under that priesthood. So we're not under that law. That law means nothing to us. Really? So to make an argument that, well, if I, under grace and I don't have to, then, then I can live however I want and not live under that law, you were never under that law any more than you're under the law of, of Germany living here in the United States of America. Now, I don't know what laws they got, but whatever they are, you know. Well, here's one for you. You know, on the Autobahn, you can drive as fast as you want to. There's a law that you can, that you're not. Try that here. <laughs> try it and see what happens. See, so go out there, get on Interstate 4 and mash down on the, on the gas pedal and get the car up to about 170 miles an hour and see how long it takes before you go to jail. Because that's a law in Germany, but it's not a law here. Okay? You're not, you can't claim to the police officer when he pulls you over, but I'm, living, I'm working under the laws of Germany here, officer. Because if you do that, he's going to get the breathalyzer out, right? We don't live under this, under the law of Moses. That's for a different time and for a different people, and we don't live there. We live under the gospel. Does that help? Okay. All right. So, so the long and the short of this is that grace, where, where the argument that grace allows men to sin, grace does not permit men to live in sin. It calls them to live in righteousness. Uh, because as, as born-again folk, they have the ability to live righteously. And not only that, they have a desire to live righteously. So those that try to make the claim that grace allows men to sin, or that I can live however I want because of grace, you just establish the fact that you don't have within you the understanding that you need that would prove that you're a child of God. You have within you everything that teaches that you're not one. Okay? And we're going to see that as we, as we continue on. Now, we finished objection one. Let's move on to objection two. And, and this is a, a variation on the theme that if we're not under the law, and again we're talking about the law of Moses, that if we don't have to keep the law of Moses in order to get saved, then there's no moral obligation to live godly. We're not obliged to live godly if, we're not, if we don't have to live by the law in order to get saved. There's no re in other words, um, what's in it for me? What's in it for me to live godly if, I don't, if, it's, if I'm not going to get eternal sa salvation out of this? If I'm not going to get anything, any goodies out of this, then what the heck's in it for me? Why should I do it? That doesn't sound like a saved person, does it? And we're going to see that that's usually the case. Now Paul answers here that the vital union with Christ that we're placed in by God, wherein he imputes Christ's righteousness upon us, establishes a higher moral objection for us to live godly. What's that? What are those hot dogs? Hebrew National Franks. Do you remember their tagline? We answer to a higher authority. They're, they were, yeah, Hebrew National. That was their ad. We answer to a higher authority. You as children of God answer to a higher authority. So you shouldn't be looking at it from a standpoint of, well, what's in it for me? It's not about you. We live to a higher authority. Now, this runs, this is a long section, so we'll take it in bits and pieces, but um, here in chapter 6 and verse 15, let's look at verses 15 through 20. 15 through 20. And so after, what? oh, I'm in Hebrews. That's why that doesn't look right. 15 to 20. What then? 
Shall we live in sin because we're not under the law but under grace? There's your objection. And Paul says, God forbid. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, oh, there's that word again, to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were were, past tense, the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Now there's a lot in there, okay? First, I want you to notice that we have two different laws here and two different masters. Two different laws and two different masters. Verses 15 and 16. Well, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. His, masculine. There are two masculine forces here. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin and to death, and that refers back to that law that we just read about, the law of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So there are two masculine persons, persons to whom you can yield yourself. One of them is God, obviously. The other one's the devil. And this is a principle that, that a lot of people think that, what they, that a lot of what they do in this world is benign. And that's not the case at all. That is not the case at all. If you yield yourself a servant to Satan, follow sin, then you're his servant. You are become a slave to him. If you yield yourself a servant to Christ, then you're following obedience and you're and he's your master. Okay? Turn to John chapter first John, for little John, chapter three. Verses 7 through 10. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this is the children of God, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And one thing I want you to understand. This in, in this verse nine, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That is in, that's a present tense action, which is a continuing action. They do not habitually and continually live in sin. It's not, it's not like some of the charismatics say, well, then you, if you, you never sin again once you're born again. That, that's nonsense. This is an action of continuing to live in sin, constantly and habitually live in sin. A child of God can't do that. Because within him remains that Holy Spirit that's tugging at his heartstrings, saying, hey, knock it off. And not only that, he's then living under the wrath of God, if he continues to do that, and God's going to finally get around to letting him know, get in line. 
okay um, so that's what that that's what that is 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 teaching a child of God can't continually and habitually live that way and receive any satisfaction or happiness in this life he just can't do it now he can sin and he can try to do it but his life's going to be miserable he's not going to get any breaks he's going to he's going to he's just going to be miserable because on the inside the inside of him is pulling at him god is pounding on his head that's a miserable exi existence there are people that decide to go that way but they live a miserable existence and that's their choice that's how they want to get through life fine knock yourself out but but you're not going to get any much benefits it's like the old saying goes you can do it the easy way and yield to god you can do it the hard way and be punished pick one take your pick that's where free will comes in folks free will comes in in this aspect you can yield to God or you cannot yield to God. Um, now on the other hand, a child of the devil, an unregenerate person, can't do anything but continually and habitually live in sin. They, they have nothing to keep them from living in sin. And they, agree, they receive a great deal of happiness and satisfaction from living that life and they believe they're doing exactly what they should do things tend to come to them and and there's a reason for that that we're going to get into here in just a couple of minutes um, there's a reason that that Satan's referred to as the God of this world there's a reason that ungodly unregenerate people seem to do better under God, under the God of this world system than people that serve the God of heaven do. It's just natural and it, it'll make sense when we get there. You, you will, it'll come clear to you when, when we get to it here in just a couple of minutes. The word servant in verse 16 is from the Greek word doulos which means a bond servant. servant. Now you remember at the very beginning of this study we, we talked about how Paul was a doulos relative to Christ and what a doulos is a bondservant is someone who is voluntarily decided to work for this particular master okay in, in, in other words back in the old days in the first century let's say um, if you got into debt you could sell yourself into slavery to pay the debt off and you might say well depending on how much money it is maybe I'll work for you for I'll work for you for three years and then at the end of three years then that'll pay the debt off and then I'm free again there are some people that at the end of that time they come to a realization that life for them is better off being a servant than it is just being out here on in the world by themselves there are people that need that need that type of struggle not maybe not slavery but you would liken them to people that are employees today. They're not they're not good at being out there by themselves as businessmen, but they're very good at being employees. They can take the instruction, they can do the work. So it, it was the same type of a situation. Well, one of these people that had completed the term and was now to be set free might make the decision that, you know what, I'm, I just as soon stay here as a servant. And they would poke a hole in their ear. That's what those things are, by the way, that you see the kids wearing. That's really what that was. That was a sign that you were a doulos, that you were a servant to someone. Then that you voluntarily became a servant to that person. All right? That's, what, that's this word doulos. Now, a child of God you voluntarily choose to serve Christ as a doulos or you voluntarily choose to serve the devil as a doulos. You want me to repeat that? It starts getting a little bit scary. You either voluntarily choose to serve God or you voluntarily choose to serve the devil. 
you're not forced to serve either one of them. You make that choice. You decide on that. Now, if you're unregenerate, not born again, you really don't have a choice. You don't have a choice to follow God. You don't have the ability to follow God. So you, won't, you only get to pick from column A. But if you're a child of God, you can pick from column A or column B. But whichever you pick, you pick. And you live with the consequences of your choice. Now, there's another important point about this word yield. And that refers to something we call chattel slavery. Chattel slavery. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. We just gave the example of someone that, that got, well, you know, one of the way, back in the 1600s, 1700s, there were a lot of people over in Europe, especially in the 1720s, Twenties, I guess, during the potato famine that were starving to death in Ireland and Scotland that came, that wanted to come to America, but they didn't have anything. They didn't have any money. How, how am I going to pay the passage to get to America? Well, I'll sell myself into slavery, and that will pay my passage. Now, if I'm a, if I'm a skilled worker, I might only have to work for a couple of years. If, I'm, if I have no real skills, I might have to work for six or seven years. But that's how I'm gonna pay this off. They, they didn't have the American Express card back in those days. It was cash on the barrel head. So you don't have the cash, you sell yourself as a slave to someone that does have the cash, and then when you come to America, you go to work for them. And you work for them until you pay the debt off. Now, in this, chattel slavery world, anything that you own at the time you become a slave now becomes the property of the master for however long you're under that under that contract. So you have a house and you go into slavery, your master now owns the house and if he wants he can move you out of the house and move somebody else in it because it's his house until you finish the term. That's the idea of chattel slavery. If you have a car, it becomes him, it becomes his car. If you have tools, it be, they become his tools and he might give them to you to do the work that you have to do in order to pay off the bill, but that's his decision to make. Once you become his servant, everything you have belongs to him as long as you're his servant. Now that's gonna become vitally important later today or next week. Just remember that idea of chattel slavery, that when you become a servant of someone else in a chattel slavery situation, all of your property now belongs to, the, to your master. Okay, and that's gonna answer a bunch of questions. Um, so hang on to that one. Um, there are also some very important occult implications here and some very important warnings. Um, the devil cannot simply jump on top of you and overtake you. He can't do that. But if you open a door up and you let him in, good luck getting rid of him. So there are things that now, the original members of this church remember that Conrad went through kind of a bondage breaker thing before, before he started the church. There are, there are things that you can get involved in without even knowing about it that, that can open doors. Don't open the doors. Don't even get around the stuff that can open doors. Things like the Masonic Lodge, things like pagan religions, um, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, some of those within the charismatic movement, like what was that guy's name, Todd Bentley, the guy, that, that boy, that'll open a door in a minute, you start listening to that kind of nonsense. And once you allow 
and yield yourself to that stuff, you become a chattel slave to the person you, or to the being that you yielded yourself to. So the best thing to do with that stuff is stay so far away from it that you don't ever have anything to do with it. Don't even go visit. Don't even go look at it. Stay far, far away from it. Because if you don't and you open a door, well, again, it's your choice, but that's not a wise choice at all. Jesus Christ died on a cross to deliver you from that stuff. So don't yield yourself to it, or you might end up someplace that you don't want to be. And that's that's as far as I'm going to get on. I don't want to get into the. I don't want to get into the occult. Because I don't want you to open a door, and I don't want to open a door either. So I know it's out there. Just stay out there, and I'll stay in here. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Okay. Verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye, have, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. They obeyed from the heart. Obey, they obeyed from the Look at Proverbs chapter 16. And remember... How do you obey from the heart? Who has the ability to obey from the heart? Does an unregenerate man have the ability to obey from the heart? No. No. Only children of God have the ability. Paul's talking to children of God and he says that ye were, past tense, the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Okay. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 1, we read the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. It's God that prepares your heart. God has to prepare your heart in order for you to answer and be obedient to it. Um, look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And beginning at verse 25. It says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. That's the new birth. God's acting on it. Now, there's a question as to this, cause them. Um, and some people will say, well, see there, God forces you to do it. Because he causes you to walk in, your, in his statutes. Look at Ezekiel chapter 11. In Ezekiel chapter 11 verses 19 and 20, we have pretty much the same thing that's being said. With one slight difference. And it explains that word cause. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. The cause in Ezekiel 36 is an enabling cause. He gives us the ability to walk in his statutes. He doesn't force us to. Okay? Okay. Now, then Paul says back in Romans chapter 6, 
God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. The literal translation of the Greek words here is whereto ye were delivered. That form of doctrine whereto ye were delivered. And you can, in some King James Bibles, you can actually see that right there in the center column, center column reference on this passage. Um, the verse is literally saying, thanks be to God that you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine whereto ye were delivered. And what is delivered? It means saved, doesn't it? You see, you obeyed from the heart what was given to you. What was delivered to you? The form of doctrine that was delivered to you. We obey because God's delivered us by that form of doctrine. Now, think about this for a minute. If you can't hear that form of doctrine, if you can't understand that form of doctrine, if you can't believe that form of doctrine, then how in the world are you going to follow it from the heart and was it really delivered to you to start with? Okay? In order for us to hear, in order for us to understand, in order for us to believe, and I don't need to go to all the verses again, we've, we've gone over them time and time again. You have to have already been changed. God has already had to have acted upon you. And in verse 18 it says, being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Now think about this. We studied Romans all the way up to chapter 6 and we talked about the faith of Jesus Christ over and over and over and over again ad nauseum that that is the faith that brings about the righteousness of God and eternally saves you. So just go back to your notes. We don't need to hammer this one all day long. You're saved through faith. Whose faith? His faith. That's how you're saved. For by grace are you saved through Christ's faith and that not of yourselves. That should answer the question right there. It's not yours. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we're made free. What's our verse say? Being then made free from sin, you see how you're made free from sin? You're not offered freedom from sin. You're not told do this, 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 and this, and maybe you can get out from under sin. No, you were made free from sin, and you were made free from sin by the obedience of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. That's how you were made free. Being, for when, um, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Um, verses 19 through 20. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants unto righteousness and unto holiness. Notice that the contrast of either being in sin and free from righteousness or being righteous and free from sin. It's kind of an either or proposition. In verse 19, if you look at verse 19 is, is the opposite of verse 18. It's, this, it's like it flips, the, co the coin flips over. You're looking at two sides of the same coin. So you look at it here, then you look at the next part, then, then verse 20 flips back to the Back to 18 again. Let's, let's look at it. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. 
I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. So here you are, servants of righteousness. And in verse 19, and for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. See, it's the other side. Servants of righteousness, servants of iniquity. By the time we get back down to verse 20, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So it's, he's trying to make the point that this yielding factor within you, you can be one and you can be the other. And he's desirous that you yield yourselves servants to righteousness. Um, and he makes the point here that the sinner is free from righteousness and that the righteous man is free from sin. Now again, doesn't mean we don't sin. We don't have to. We've been freed from it. We do because we're weak. But you don't have, you're freed from it. Where the unrighteous man is free from righteousness. He can't get to it. It's, there's no way that he can get there. Okay. Um, I want to try to wrap this. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to wrap up this chapter this morning. Verses 21 through 23. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Oh, let me point out one other thing real quick. Notice how this stuff compounds. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members' service to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. You see how it just gets worse? You start going down that road and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. You yield yourselves servants to righteousness and it just gets better and better and better. And that's and remember remember our argument. The idea that, well, I have no obligation to, to live righteously if the law is not going to save me. And Paul's saying, yeah, you do. You have an obligation. And you're going to get along a lot better if you do. Verses 21 through 23. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your, uh, your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The fruit of sin is death. Verse 21. We, we just read that. Look at James 1, 13 through 15. And we looked at this one a little bit ago also. James 1, 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So, what fruit did you have back in the old days? Before you came to an understanding of the gospel, look back at those times. What fruit do you have from that? The very things that you're ashamed of now that you wouldn't even think about touching. What kind of fruit did they produce? Death? Now the fruit of holiness is a result of our union with Jesus Christ. Here in verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Look at the Gospel of John chapter 15.
verses 4 through 8. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so, so shall ye be my disciples. You see, the fruit of holiness is just like a plant. You take a grape vine. How much fruit are you going to get if you clip the branches off? Not much, right? If they don't, if they're not tied into the root system, they're not going to bear fruit. If you're not following Christ, you're not going to bear fruit. If you yield yourselves into sin in one area or another, you're not going to you're not going to bear fruit. That area you're going to be dwarfed. You're just going to wither away to nothing. And that's the analogy he's trying to make. Abide in Christ. Don't yield over here, but abide here. Stay here, and that way you can grow. You can grow fruit. Um, when you think about it in terms of a church, there, you know, when you're dealing with, with like grapes, there's certain runners that come out off of the trunk that show promise and others that really don't. And so when you, when you clean up the plant, you go cut off the ones that don't show any promise and you, you keep the ones that do. Kind of the same way here. Um, we stumble into somebody within the church that's not abiding in Christ, and what do we do? We prune them off the branch. And it's the same way in your life as well. If you don't abide in Christ, don't expect to grow fruit. And eventually, you'll just wither away. God reads your heart. He knows what your heart is. If your heart's not in it, then eventually you just atrophy and wither up and and you're gone so the 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 command here from Christ is to abide in him and Paul's trying to make basically the same point stay solid yield yourself to God do not yield yourself to the devil and that has even more implications, as I pointed out, because of some of the slavery issues that we're going to get into probably, probably next week. Now, to wrap this chapter up, verse 23 just simply restates Romans chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. It's a summary statement of that. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we read, we, we worked ourselves through this one. Romans chapter 5, 15 through 19 says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses under justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So that's a summary statement of, of that point. Um, 
Now next week, we, we're going to start at chapter 7. We'll, we'll pick up at the beginning of chapter 7 and start to work through um, as far as we can get. Um, chapter 7 actually, it actually begins off with a discussion of, with a discussion of marriage. And so we'll chase that off for a little while and, uh, and, then, and then continue on. Um, I, I, would, I would guess that it'll take us a couple of weeks to get through chapter 7 before we get into chapter 8. And then chapter 8 is, um, gives us a list of, of the benefits of salvation by grace. Chapter 9 through 11 deals with the two Israels the two gospels, the two sal or the two salvations in the gospel. Um, chapters 12 through 15 are some practical exhortations, and chapter 16 is the is the close. But um, we're we're now at least we're up to chapter 7, and there's some there's some interesting a lot of interesting things in chapter 7, uh, especially dealing back with some of the things we talked about today. Um, and so keep those in your mind. And we uh, will come back to this again next week, Lord willing. Let's uh, let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.